Nestled in a quaint town of Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, USA, is this historic hotel, which has a special place in history. The events that occurred here changed the way you and I look at money today. The Bretton Woods Conference back in 1944 was held here at this very location. It introduced a system of monetary management and established the rules for commercial and financial relations among countries shortly after the World War. The Bretton Woods system was the first example of a fully negotiated monetary order. The planners at Bretton Woods established the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank Group. These organizations became operational in 1945 after a sufficient number of countries had ratified the agreement and continued to monitor global imbalances. Now, in 2011, at Bretton Woods, questions are being raised whether traditional organizations should give way to new systems and ideas in economic management that will include a better balance of West and East developed and developing nations. Is the IMF getting outdated? Where do we stand today in the shift of this economic axis? Is this shift being recognized enough? Are economists taking their hats off and thinking anew, afresh? Or are we still stuck with what have been traditional and more conservative ways of dealing with fiscal, monetary and political thinking? In 1971, the United States unilaterally terminated convertibility of the dollar to gold. As a result, United States dollar became the sole backing of currencies and a reserve currency for the member states. It also marked the end of the gold standard. The political basis for the Bretton Woods system was in the confluence of several key conditions. The shared experiences of the Great Depression, the concentration of power in a small number of countries led by the United States. Now there is call to balance that imbalance and bring more economic powers like China, India and others to have a say in global economic policy. The debate is on. Professor Rogoff, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate you being here on the show. Let me first start with the theme Finet, which is to create this whole space that looks at the new reality of a political economy and rather than just talk about, you know, the economics uh, of everything. Are we, are we increasingly realizing the role that governments will have to play in uh, economics in the days ahead? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a feeling there needs to be thinking outside the box, but if we knew what that was, we'd have already done it. And I think it's uh, very great that this institute's formed and that it's really being a little more experimental. I mean, I think a lot of the funding agencies, the universities, there's a natural conservatism, even though in principle it's rewarding path-breaking research. I mean, it has to break the path in a way people can see in order to understand that it's going forward. And I think also university research tends to have difficulty with people working across disciplines because tenure is given within disciplines and yet a lot of exciting things happen across disciplines and I think Ina is very open to that in a way that there's lip service to it with other funders but it's not that clear so I think it, but it's going to take a long time to really know how it works. But you know it's being looked at as Bretton Woods too do you buy that whole story? Do you buy the fact that there could be consensus on what is looking like something that's going to repeat what happened in 1944? Do you even buy that story? Well, I, I haven't quite felt the optimism about Bretton Woods too. The INET's really trying to rethink the philosophy of economics, thinking that maybe that will ultimately affect politics. But of course, we're sitting at the home of Bretton Woods, where in 1944 they formed the dollar standard, they formed the basis of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Um, they've remodeled the building. I'm not sure we've quite translated into ideas for remodeling the international financial system. In your assessment, do emerging markets have a role to play? Well, I think in terms of thinking, which is what we're talking about here, yeah. uh, uh, George Soros has tried to uh, you know, open up things in China and India and other emerging markets. So really, frankly, the fact that very few countries have competitive university systems has been something that's really held back research, particularly in economics, in many parts of the world. And this, this institute, this, uh, the 
INET in some way, I guess, to try to reach that. And of course, I, need, I don't need to tell you, a lot of the best ideas will surely come from emerging markets and parts of the world which haven't really had a voice, partly because of finances, but also really because of uh, the weak university systems or state-run universities. I mean, obviously India has some fantastic universities, so I wouldn't want to include that. Professor Rogoff, at what point do you think it's desirable for the government role to exist? I mean, because this whole talk about Bretton Woods II and the whole conference that we're here for is constantly talking about the level of government intervention going up. Are you in agreement with that idea? I mean, what do we mean by government intervention, for example? Well, I think you need regulation in financial markets, particularly because there's this so-called moral hazard problem. If somebody borrows a lot of money and then goes bust, there's a temptation to help them out. And when you're talking about giant banks that are bigger than you know, the whole economy in some countries, you have to have some checks and balances on that. If they can dig a ditch that the whole economy can't get out of, you need to have more regulation. I mean, I view this not as a fundamental departure from the market concept as yes. one, some people said, you know, even the invisible hand needs a skeleton. And, I think we need regulation as that skeleton. So then isn't there, a, isn't there a dichotomy? Because one always wonders that the level of bailouts or the expectations for bailouts has been going up. Many countries have sort of uh, taken it as a given that if there is an issue, there could be a bailout. And on the other hand, we want to still increase state intervention. So at some level, if there is enough state intervention right at the start, I suppose there would be no bailouts. But there can always be that complacency. You know, when economies go out of shape, when there is fiscal irresponsibility, just depend on a bailout. Well, they're related problems, but I mean, certainly there does need to be some discipline. This idea we economists call moral hazard, which is if you think you're always going to get bailed out, you're not very cautious, whether yeah. you're a home buyer or a country. And there needs to be discipline. And when everyone always gets bailed out and we just say we're going to be tough t next time, it's a little bit like when my uh, daughter does something wrong. If I tell her, you know, I'm, going to pun I'm not going to punish you this time, but it's going to be really bad next time, she learns the lesson that I'm never going to punish her. And I think uh, that, that's a problem, that there always needs to be some discipline. And some discipline shown, on occasion at least, in order for it to be credible. Let's pick the example of the United States. Financial, financial market growth, great numbers from banks, corporate earnings are a flush. I mean, we're talking about a growth that seems highly frothy because at the same time, you don't have jobs, you don't have a housing sector sort of coming back. And then there is the sense of euphoria with the Dow Jones on the high and you know, looking at just corporate numbers. Are we missing the point of the recovery stage that the U.S. economy is in? Well, a striking fact is that labor share of income, which had almost been like Planck's constant in the United States for a century, has been plummeting. It's below 60 percent for the first time in a very, very long time. And a lot of the profits come from the fact labor share has been declining. We call it productivity, and I think some of it has been productivity, but there hasn't been overall growth. And of course, Incomes of the middle class have stagnated. There's very high unemployment still. Housing prices are still collapsing in many parts of the country. And uh, the corporate profits can't be growing indefinitely. What exactly are we signaling through a government shutdown? And how can exactly America have a government shutting down? How do you define the state in which it lies today? It's pretty embarrassing to have the shutdown of the government. It's childish. I mean, we have debt problems. We have lots of problems. but. This is no way to run your country. I think actually it's not so much President Obama's weakness as the weakness of the leadership in the Republican Party. There's this very powerful Tea Party movement where it's very rebellious and ornery and angry and mad at the government. They love seeing the government shut down. While you're positive marginally about Obama, what is your report card on him? I don't want to go 180 degrees. I was from defending him to say that everything's been perfect. I mean, I think clearly the health insurance was done in a very inefficient way, a spectacularly inefficient way. On the other hand, we didn't have a Great Depression, and people forget that we could have. And I think he really, you know, pulled out a lot of stops, shifted a lot of energy on that. I don't agree with everything he did. I wish we hadn't uh, bailed out the big banks so generously. We should have taken more equity. The taxpayer should have gotten a lot of the upside.
This show brought to you by Sugar Free Delight, light and healthy. In Dubai, lives converge and opportunity abounds. It's just a question of when and when. And the nomination. Dubai, every day is an opportunity. India's largest gold financing company in terms of loan portfolio, Muttut Finance Limited, now offers a public issue of 515 lakh equity shares of 10 rupees each for cash at a premium. The 100% book built issue is being offered in a price band of 160 to 175 rupees per share. Issue opens 18th April, closes 20th April for QIB bidders and 21st April for retail and non-institutional bidders. For risk factors and more details, refer to Red Herring Prospectus. Available on the websites of SEBI, Book Running and Go Book Running Lead Managers. Switch off the noise. Switch on the news. From headline grabbing business deals to all the political, sports and entertainment action. It's a heady cocktail. And it's just what you need to know. The 10 stories that define your day at 10 p.m. every day. Catch Top 10 at 10 only on ET Now. Brought to you by Hyundai New Thinking, New Possibilities. Flipkart.com. Over 10 million books now delivered to your doorstep. Blue Star. Get office-like cooling at home. Aditya Birla Group is clearly on an acquisition spree. They are now uh, looking at picking up Dom's Joe Fiber, a Swedish-based company. The valuation, like you mentioned, upwards of 300 million is what sources tell us. Captive Pulp is a strategic imperative for our VSF business and Domjo is a perfect fit in this strategy. It is not today's game, but tomorrow's valuation that will meet your expectations. Get a peek into the immediate future with focused market cues. Get unique trading ideas from trusted market authorities. Catch! Free stocks that shall outperform the market and get notice of a game-changing strategy that can completely transform the sector outlook. Make the most of the expert forecast with markets tomorrow. Corporate India is opening new doors of opportunity. Business dynamics are constantly evolving. Business First is your window to trends that evolve in India Inc. With the biggest business stories from the sharpest reporting team. Inside access to corporate dealings on priority for your business. With Business First. Every weeknight at 8, only on ET Now. Brought to you by IIFL. Knowledge is the edge. Widest range of designer 5-star ACs. The Toyota range of SUVs, the crux of power. Is the world ready for Bretton Woods Part 2? It's a time for us to unshackle away from conservative and traditional financial regulation to one that's more on the spot. I, Shelley Chopra, will connect the dots for you, coming to you from the very venue of the 1944 conference with Bretton Woods 2. The gates of the Lal Street are now open to the Indian startup community. And we bring you an exclusive matchup between eight of India's fastest growing companies and the heads of the BSE SME Exchange. On starting up only on ET Now. Brought to you by Make My Trip Memories Unlimited. 